Hello from my robo. My name is John, and in a recent video I demonstrated how to build this simple robot using my new Arduino Robot Project Shield version 2. ARPS2 is designed to make it easy for beginners to learn Arduino programming and to build simple robots like this one. In that previous video, the robot was programmed to use these breakaway optical sensor modules to detect the edge of a desk so the robot wouldn't fall to the floor. In this video, I'm going to show you how to program the robot to detect obstacles in front of it using one of these sonar modules. I'm going to lead you through creating a sonar function for the robot starter program that I shared last time. And I'll also give you some important tips on how to make the sonar hardware and software more accurate, more reliable, and more versatile. So be sure to watch until the end of the video. It's going to be a long one, but I think you'll have a comprehensive understanding of how this module works and how to use it better when I'm done. Let's look at a typical HCSRO4 sonar module. It has two ultrasonic transducers. One acts as a speaker to transmit a short burst of high frequency sound waves, and the other acts like a microphone to receive any transmitted sound waves that have bounced off nearby walls or objects. It also has four electrical connections at the bottom. The first is labeled VCC, which is the positive 5 volt power supply pin. The next is TRIG, which is the module's trigger input pin. Setting the trigger pin high starts the sonar ranging process by transmitting a burst of ultrasonic sound pulses, which I'll refer to as a ping. The third pin is labeled echo, and this is the module's output pin that our program will need to read to determine the distance to the target and the status of the sonar module. Last is ground, labeled GND, which is the module's negative power supply pin. The sonar module needs to be connected to a microcontroller, and ARPS2 makes this really easy. ARPS2 and some of my other circuits has these four three-pin expansion headers named H1, H2, H3, and H4. Looking at the schematic diagram for ARPS2, each of the headers has a signal pin connected to one of the Arduino's I.O. lines, a plus 5 volt power pin, and a ground pin, so each of these headers can be used on its own to connect either an external input or output device to ARPS2. Taking a look at the header layout on the PCB or printed circuit board, you can see that header H1 is misaligned, and if you read the warning, that header H4 has been rotated. The square pads indicate which header pin is pin 1, or the signal pin of each header. For headers H1 to H3, all of the signal pins are closest to the edge of the PCB, but for H4, the signal pin is farthest away from the edge of the PCB. The middle pin of each header is the power supply's plus 5 volt pin, and the third pin is the power supply's ground or negative pin. The headers have deliberately been arranged this way to make it easy to mount a sonar module right onto the circuit board. All you have to do is solder a 4-pin header socket, like this one, across the four headers in the location marked by this rectangular outline on the PCB silk screen. When you do that, plugging in the sonar module will connect it to power, the trig and echo signal pins, and ground. Before I plug the sonar module into this ARPS2, I have to make sure that the batteries and USB cable have been disconnected from my circuit, because it's possible to damage the sonar module if it's plugged in or unplugged with power applied. Now let's take a look at the software needed to use the sonar module. I've opened the sonar starter program in the Arduino IDE. It's basically the same as the robot starter program from my previous ARPS2 robot video, but with additional sonar configuration code added and I've put a link to the program in the comments below. The first thing I added to the program are these additional pin constant definitions for the optional and special purpose input-output or I.O. pins on ARPS2. In this group of I.O. pin definitions, you can see the pin constants for headers H1, H2, H3, and H4. In addition, the same pin used for H2 has also been assigned the name Trig, and the pin used for H3 has been given the name Echo. Note that it's common practice in C programs to use all capital letters when naming I.O. constants. In the setup function, I've added pin mode statements to initialize each of the four H1 to H4 header pins. It's safe practice to set up any unused pins as inputs, which I've done with H1 and H4, as the sonar module only uses these parts of the headers for plus 5 volt power and ground. Making them inputs provides a high impedance that won't allow any current to flow if you inadvertently connect an output device or accidentally short any of the signal pins. I've also set the echo pin as an input and the trig pin as an output. At this point you should be thinking, wait, if the trig is an output, what will its output actually be? Will it be high or low? That's an important question, and the question won't be the same for every type of microcontroller. 
The Arduino compiler will always make any input pin low after initialization, but if you're using some other microcontrollers or different C compilers, you may need to set the output state to low before enabling the pin to prevent an output glitch. Again, using the Arduino IDE, there's nothing we need to do other than set the trig pin as an output. Now I'm going to scroll up to see my program variables. I've created a new variable called distance, which will represent the distance to any target objects in centimeters. The main part of the program is mostly unchanged from the robot starter program. The program reads the push button switch states into variables first, and these variables are then used to make decisions about which direction to drive the motors. Then the analog inputs are read and displayed using the serial monitor. Right below that, I've added a statement to read the sonar range into the distance variable and some new serial print statements that will display the distance in the serial monitor, just like the other values. Another change I made was to extend the main loop's delay so the serial monitor will only be updated once per second. Now let's create the sonar range function. I've added a sonar range function definition right above the stop function. I haven't put any program code into the function yet, just some comments to tell us what it has to do. Before we get into the function, notice the one main difference between the sonar range function and the stop function. The sonar range function includes an int return type specifier instead of the stop function's void type. The stop function doesn't return any data. It just does its job and stops the motors, so there's nothing for it to return. But the sonar range function is going to return the range to the target in the form of a number, and this number will be expressed as an integer. So the function definition has to include the data type of the number being returned. The first thing the sonar range function has to do is to start a ping by making the trigger pulse on the trig pin. The sonar module's data sheet says the trig pin needs to be high for at least 10 microseconds to initiate a measurement. So let's do that now. I'm going to add a digital write statement to set trig high. Then I'll add a 10 microsecond delay. Then I'll make the trig pin go low again. After starting the ping, the sonar module will transmit a burst of ultrasonic pulses and then switch into receive mode. When it does this, it will set the echo pin high, and our program will have to watch for that. One way to wait for the echo pin to go high is to use an empty while loop, like this. This loop will hold the microcontroller here until the echo pin goes high. Next we'll have to measure the time that the echo pin stays high, and a second while loop could be used to do that. But instead of using two separate while loops for this, we can use Arduino's built-in pulse in function to accomplish both tasks. Let's go to the Arduino language reference webpage to find out more about the pulse in function. I've put a link to it in the description below the video, so you can follow along or refer to it later. The language reference is broken into sections for functions, variables, and structures. And the functions section that I'm looking at is further divided into digital I.O., which includes things like the digital read and digital write functions, analog I.O., and advanced I.O. functions, plus many more. The pulse in function is in the advanced I.O. section. Let's take a look at how it works. Its description says, reads a pulse, either high or low, on a pin. For example, if the value is high, pulse in waits for the pin to go from low to high, starts timing, then waits for the pin to go low and stops timing, returns the length of the pulse in microseconds, or gives up and returns zero if no complete pulse was received within the timeout. That sounds like exactly what we need. The syntax shows how to use it. We need to give the function a pin number as well as the value we're looking for. We can also provide an optional timeout value, but since we don't know that yet, we can just leave it out. The function returns the length of the pulse in microseconds as an unsigned long number. We'll need to implement that data type to use the function properly. Okay, let me write this into the program code. I'm going to remove the while loop and replace it with the pulse in function. I'm going to create an unsigned long duration variable to store the result from pulse in, and I'm going to set pulse in to wait for echo to go high. Once I have the time duration of the echo pulse, all I have to do is convert it into a distance value and return it to the calling code. Rather than have the program do all of the physics calculations required, I can simplify the code if I know how long it takes for sound to travel a distance of one centimeter. That value is about 29 microseconds. And since the sound wave has to travel from the transmitter to the target and back to the receiver, I have to double the time value I use in my calculation to 58 microseconds instead of 29. 
So dividing the duration by 58 will tell me the distance to the nearest target in centimeters. But duration is an unsigned long number, and dividing it by 58 will produce a floating point number. So I'm going to have to fix the number as an integer before returning it to match the return type I originally set as part of the sonar range function. And that's it. Now let's test the function to see if it works. I'm going to compile the program and upload it to my robot. The beep indicates that the program is running, so now I'll open the serial monitor and see the distance output. I've put this bin 15 centimeters from the front of my robot, and that's exactly what my reading is, so my program seems to be working. Remember that at the beginning of the video, I said I would show you how to make the sonar function more accurate, more versatile, and more reliable? Let me show you that now. One way to make sonar distance measurements more accurate is to understand the limitations of physics and the physical layout of the parts. Watch what happens as I bring my target closer to the robot. The range decreases. 6 centimeters, 5 centimeters, 4 centimeters, 3 centimeters. Wait, 7 centimeters? As I moved the target really close, the range went back up. But why? Think of the sound beam being projected from the transmit transducer. It doesn't have enough distance to spread out so it can be received by the receiver, so it is probably being reflected off the target, bounced off the sonar module's PCB, being reflected by the target again, and then being received by the receiver. All of the extra bounces add distance and lead to the erroneous distance measurement. How can you get around this zone of confusion at close distances? The easiest way is to mount your sonar module three to four centimeters back from the edge of your project to allow the beam to spread enough before being reflected by the target so that it can be received properly. If you move the sonar module back, you can even put its distance offset into the distance calculation to provide accurate measurements from the actual edge of your project. Other measurement problems will occur due to the shape, angle, material, size, and distance of the target. By angling my target away from the sonar, the sound pulse will be reflected away from the receiver, resulting in an inaccurate reading. Large, dense, and irregular objects will reflect sound waves the best. Small, round, and soft objects will reflect sound waves poorly and won't be as detectable over long distances. And while many of these modules claim sensing distances of 3 to 4 meters, that's only true of large, solid objects, like a brick wall, totally perpendicular to the sensor. For smaller objects, the typical maximum ranges are between 1 and 2 meters. Next, let's make the sonar range function more versatile and reliable. If I'm making my robot into a sumo bot, for example, I may not want my robot to detect any objects outside of the range of the sumo ring. I could do that by limiting the range of my search, which I should be able to accomplish using the timeout value of the pulse in function. Referring back to the description of the pulse in function in the Arduino language reference, the timeout value is an unsigned long number used to specify how long the microcontroller will wait for both the echo pulse to start as well as for a complete echo pulse to be received. I don't yet know how long it will take for the echo pulse to start, but I do know the duration of the pulse will correspond to my maximum range, so I'm going to start by adding a max range parameter to the sonar range function declaration. Next, I'm going to change the pulse in function to add a timeout value that's equivalent to max times 58, the maximum length of time I expect the pulse to be. Remember, this converts my distance to time. The sonar module datasheet indicates that a ping consists of eight waves of a 40 kHz sound signal. At 40 kHz, each wave has a period of 25 microseconds, so I would expect the echo signal to go high about 200 microseconds after the trig pulse, but I'm going to check that using an oscilloscope to be sure. The yellow trace shows the trig pulse, and the pink trace shows the echo signal. My horizontal time base is 50 microseconds per division, and it's about 4 divisions or 200 microseconds between trig and echo, which exactly matches the datasheet. If I zoom out, you will even be able to see the echo pulse change in size as I move the target closer and farther from the robot. So for this sonar module, I'm going to add the extra 200 microseconds to the timeout calculation. If the echo pulse is longer than the timeout value, or doesn't finish before the timeout, the pulse in function will return zero. Zero seems like a good number to indicate that no target was found within the target area. So if pulse in times out, I'm just going to return zero and bypass the distance calculation. 
Before I compile the program, I also have to change the function call to my sonar range function to provide a maximum range value. I'm going to limit the maximum range to 20 centimeters for this test, since that allows me to keep both the robot and the target on my workbench. Let's see how it works. Okay, I can get to 19 centimeters, and for distances longer than that, I get zero. I'd like to get to 20, so I'm just going to increase the timeout calculation by one. There we go, 20 centimeters, and then zero. I think the sonar range limiter is a great idea, but it does create a new and potentially big problem. Any robot that needs to sense its close surroundings might need to do so rapidly. So as soon as the first distance reading has been received, your robot might try to start a new range measurement. The problem with this is that while our function exited the current range measurement early by timing out, the sonar module could still be waiting for the current range measurement to complete, and we can't start a new ping while the previous ping is still in progress. It's easy to check for this by testing the state of the echo pin before trying to make a new trigger pulse. I can add an if statement at the top of my function to do this. If a previous ping is in progress, I'll just exit the function and return an error. The microcontroller can then continue with other work instead of waiting for the previous measurement to finish. I'll use minus one as the error code to signal to my calling code that the sonar module wasn't ready to take a new measurement yet. To test this function, I'll add some code to check for a minus one result before outputting the distance value to the serial monitor, and I'll print the word skipped if the sonar module wasn't ready and had to skip a reading. To test it and try to see if any measurements are actually skipped, I'll have to remove the loop delay and move my target far enough away so that pulse in times out. I'll upload the program and move the target. Yep, there it is. Without checking for the echo in progress, our function would have tried to re-trigger the sonar module, potentially producing unpredictable results. I've even had some sonar modules lock up and stop responding at all when this happens. And the only way to fix it was to reset power to the sonar module and microcontroller. So it's always good to check for expected starting states before assuming things will just work. Okay, let's recap what we did to make this new sonar range function. We started by initializing the trig and echo pins for the sonar module. Then we created a function to output the proper size and polarity trig pulse, followed by measuring the length of the input echo pulse. After that, we had the function convert the pulse length into distance and return the distance to the calling program. Then we enhanced the function by adding a distance cutoff, which is useful for many types of applications, and added a simple check to see if a previous measurement is in progress to make the function more reliable. And during testing, we experimented with angles and distances to get an idea of the physical limitations of the sonar module. The result is a new, more versatile sonar range function than many of the other code examples you might find out there on the internet and hopefully, for you, a better understanding of how to make and test a new function. Thanks for watching, and if you found this video useful, please like and subscribe to get a new ping when I create new videos. Until next time, keep learning.